We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. Aphex Twin. Also known by his real name of Richard David James as well as a bajillion other pseudonyms, Aphex Twin is one of the most influential and critically acclaimed figures in the history of electronic music. He has dabbled in a whole wide variety of genres like IDM, techno, acid, ambient, breakbeat, house, drum and bass, drill and bass, glitch, experimental, electroacoustic, and plenty, plenty more. He is also my favorite artist of all time, making hundreds of some of my favorite songs ever that I still enjoy to this day even after listening to his music for several years now. And when I say hundreds, I mean hundreds. If there's anything this guy likes more than making shit up about himself, it's EPs, compilations, aliases, EPs, bonus tracks, EPs that are long enough to be considered albums, not actually releasing his music, the occasional album, and did I forget to mention EPs? He has released a gargantuan amount of music over the course of his three decade plus career to say the least. And in this video, I've decided to rank 63 different releases from his most popular to his most obscure from worst to best, basically covering almost the entirety of his discography in the process. However, before I get into the list, I need to go over a few things. First of all, while this list is far longer than any other Aphex Twin Worst to Best video out there, I'm not going to cover everything. If I did, I would probably die. So this means that there's a handful of smaller and unimportant releases that I've decided to skip over. Here are a few of the more notable ones. I won't be covering the SoundCloud dump, Cyrobonkers, or Mount Fuji since they are all basically large dumps of unreleased tracks and demos and I feel like if I cover one, then I'd have to do the rest, and you are not making me rank the SoundCloud dump with its 280 tracks. I will also be excluding any promos like words and music. The Universal Indicator albums aren't going to be on this list either because while Richard most likely had a hand in it, it is not known which ones he actually officially worked on. You won't see the compilations Chosen Lords and the imaginatively titled Compilation because they don't have any original tracks and I basically talk about every song on these albums in other parts of the video. On the other hand, I won't cover stuff like the Hangable Audible EPs and a lot of Richard's remixes because they would later come out on more convenient compilations like Hangable Autobulb and 26 Mixes for Cash. And then finally there are a few other smaller ones on screen right now. Pretty much everything I haven't mentioned or listed or implied yet is fair game for the list. Next, when it comes to my reviews and justifications I give for my rankings, keep in mind that I'm not a professional critic, obviously, and I intend to stay that way. I'm just a guy in my room talking about music, so while I do try my best to be knowledgeable and objective, I will also blatantly admit that some things will get points because of nostalgia or just because I feel like it. Also, a lot of Richard's records have been re-released with bonus tracks over the years, and if anyone was wondering, I will occasionally talk about those bonus tracks, but they will only have an effect on the ranking and rating of a release if they are notably good or bad. And then finally, a warning. This is a worst to best ranking, which means I'll be giving my opinions. Even some negative opinions. And worst of all, opinions you'll disagree with. Yeah, I know Aphex Twin fans have a bad reputation for calling everything Richard does a transcendent masterpiece, but trust me when I say that I'm not one of those fans. If I think something's shit, I'll call it shit. And just keep in mind that you're totally going to disagree with a lot of the things I say here. I mean, there's next to a 0% chance that you will agree with the exact positioning of all 63 releases I'll be talking about. So when you disagree, make a comment telling me what you think and don't be an asshole about it. Although, if you're going to make a butthurt comment, come up with some creative insults. It's the least you could do. But now with all that shit out of the way, we can finally get into the list. Here's Aphex Twin's discography ranked worst to best. No. Eh. I love it. EP blows. And at the bottom of the list, we find Joyrex J9i. Don't know what it is? Good. Jokes aside though, 
This small and obscure EP is part of a series of similarly named EPs that Richard released in the early 90s under the name of Caustic Window. And as you'll soon find out, I'm not a big fan of them. I feel like most of the material on these EPs is just half-baked leftovers of other stuff he was releasing at the time, and Joyrick's J9i is the worst example. The first track is Humanoid Must Not Escape, which starts out very promising with its catchy acid groove. But that promise is slowly spoiled over its almost 6 minute runtime with its terribly annoying sample choices and lack of anything else. The second track is Fantasia, and... No. No. All I'm gonna say is that Richard should have probably laid off whatever he was taking when he was making this track. Also, I hope he enjoyed the porn he was watching. And just like that, Joyrick's J9i is already over. While I did consider excluding it from the list because of how short and obscure it is, I decided to include it anyway because it's just very bad. I mean, on every other record in this list, I like at least one song. I cannot say the same for this EP though, as both songs are legitimately a struggle for me to get through. And while I do feel bad for picking on a two track EP, actually I don't feel bad at all. I think it has definitely earned its place at the bottom of the list. Yo! Just my temperature at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Jesus Christ! Nice! Smodge Face is a relatively unknown EP from the early 2000s, named after an alias that Richard only ever rarely used. And to be honest, I didn't want to put it so low. The reason why is because I absolutely love the first track, which is a remix of Run the Place Red by The Bug and Daddy Freddy. It's an amazingly fun breakcore song with a bunch of energy and even more personality. The only thing I dislike about it is how it ends with harsh static. And sadly, that ending foreshadows the rest of the EP, which consists of two tracks full of completely unlistenable noise music. These two tracks, both named KTPA, are just unbearable, and the worst part is, is that they make up the majority of the EP. I know there are some people out there who actually don't mind noise music, somehow, but I am not one of those people. So while I love Run the Place Red so much, the two noise tracks just drop the EP all the way down here. What an injustice. I was picking off an awful lot of shit, eh? Can you smell that shit? Yes, I could smell an awful lot of shit there. So while the worst to best format is a very cool way to review a discography, it has its flaws. One of those flaws is the fact that I have to start talking about the Analog Bubble Bath series with this EP, which is weird to say the least. The Analog Bubble Bath series started with Richard's first ever release in 1991. In 1992, Analog Bubble Bath 3 was released on vinyl, but then was re-released on CD a year later with a whopping five new tracks. While this was cool, it now meant that vinyl owners were basically stuck with what is pretty much an inferior version of it as a result. But don't you worry vinyl owners, because here comes Analog Bubble Bath 3.1 to supply you with those sweet, sweet new tracks. Four years later, what the fuck? To add on to that, this EP doesn't even have all the now old tracks. Just three of them plus two original ones. Let's look at the old songs first. The first track is a fun and evil sounding song with a catchy acid groove and beat. The fourth track is another one of my favorites, being very soft, comforting, and breezy. It acts as a nice breath of fresh air when shoved in between all these acid techno songs both here and on Analog Bubble Bath 3. It 
If I were a vinyl enthusiast, I would definitely want to have these tracks in my collection. However, things go downhill of track 2. It starts out sounding promising, but just doesn't go anywhere with it. Actually, it starts getting annoying after a while. So the old stuff is mostly good, but what about the new stuff? Well, track 3 is just 10 seconds long, so let's give it a listen. Oh, well, maybe track 5 will leave more of an impact. Yes, I can smell an awful lot of shit there. And a lot of feces as well. It's just shit smothered on the microphone, I think. Well, that certainly was an impact. Yeah, the reason why this EP is so low is because the good tracks are already available on another release, and the new stuff is... Shit. And while it is cool that vinyl collectors were able to get their hands on some of these tracks, as someone who doesn't give a shit, I don't give a shit. Just go listen to Analog Bubble Bath 3 instead. It's my woman. I have crippling depression. Here we have another Joyrex EP, this time being one that released the same month as the last one. And like Smodge Face, I feel bad for putting it solo because it has one of my favorite Caustic Window tracks in Garden of Lemiri. This song has a great atmosphere and its heavy distorted kicks, which Richard loved experimenting with at the time, go incredibly hard. <laughs> Why it was used in the entire commercial though, I have no clue, but it actually works very well. The other tracks, however, are just nowhere near as good. The first track is Fantasia, which we're already well acquainted with. The second is Clayhill Dub, which is interesting being Richard's only attempt at dub music, and it has a cool atmosphere, however, there is very little else to it. And then the last track promises a lot by supposedly being a hardcore remix of We Are The Music Makers from Selected Ambient Works 85 to 92. But really, it's just boring and sounds like crap. So once again, just like Smodge Face, while this EP has a standout track in Garden of Lemiri, the other tracks just aren't good enough to support it. Although at least this time, those tracks are slightly more bearable. Here we have our first Annalord EP of the list. And the Lord was a series of 11 EPs released throughout the course of 2005, with a bunch of bonus tracks later added in 2009, making the whole thing almost 5 hours long. The whole series is basically Richard's return to acid techno, each EP taking a slightly different approach, and as you'll soon find out, I think the whole thing is a huge mixed bag. It has some of Richard's best EPs and songs, but it also has some of his worst. In this case, the worst is And the Lord 9. The style this EP aims for is based around chaotic climaxes driven by simple but fast-paced beats. However, tracks like pwsteel.bankos.q, trojan.killab.e, and backdoor.netshadow just don't do this well. Really, these three tracks just sound incredibly ugly and disjointed to me. The one thing that goes in their favor are the amazing beats, which are actually the one thing I think is consistent throughout the entire series. The percussion is always top notch. The only track that does what this EP is trying to go for well in my opinion is W32.Apex at MM. The climactic parts, which actually borrow from Trojan.KillAV.E, sound a lot better and not as ugly as the other tracks. Just really messy.
Another song I like is the one bonus track in Lipton's Be Acid. It doesn't fit at all with the other songs here, which is going to be a trend among these Annalord bonus tracks, but it has an addicting groove to it. But even then, these two good songs are not all that special to me, and the other tracks on Annalore 9 are nothing I'll actively listen to again, making this EP the worst in the entire series for me. After that initial batch of EPs, we have our first album of the list, and Oh boy, it's a doozy. London 030617, aka Field Day, was originally released as an 11 track EP on vinyl at the Field Day Festival in 2017 when Aphex Twin played there. However, shortly afterwards, several digital re releases would add a bunch of bonus tracks, turning it into a 21 track album. And I'll be honest here, it's very hard to get through. At least the previous EPs were short, but Field Day is 70 minutes long and has a sound palette that I can only describe as an underdeveloped version of Collapse that most of the time is ugly, annoying, nothing special, or all three at once. Most of the tracks sound the same as well, which, combined with the fact that the song titles are, yeah, makes this album a forgettable listen. However, there are a handful of tracks that stand out, in a bad way. MT1T1 Bedroom Microtune, 223441, and T17 Phase Out Plus 3 are all particularly horrible tracks that are excessively ugly and annoying, while also incredibly repetitive. It is literally painful to listen to any of these tracks in full. T47 Smodge though is easily the worst track, as it's the closest this album gets to harsh noise. But while few and far between, there are some genuinely great tracks here. T20A Eid 441 is the best this album's conventional sound gets. I'm particularly a fan of that one sound effect that's both very creepy but also really cool. And it also borrows some elements from T69 Collapse, which is never a bad thing. The best songs, though, are the ones that take a different approach. EM2500M253X, for example, is a nice piano piece extremely similar to ASAT Santa from Syro. It's only two minutes long, but it's very appreciated considering what's around it. And the best song is without doubt T16.5 Madma with Nastia which sounds a lot like a Lost Selected Ambient Works 85-92 track, which, compared to Field Day's harsh and closed off sound, is a lovely change of pace. There's also tracks like 42 Demens at 10, MT1T2 Old Pedroom, SK8 Lil Tune, HSPC202, and T13 Quadro Reverbia N3 that, while not highlights, do something interesting and different. Now I did breeze over a lot of these tracks, but there are so many songs here that are similar and don't have much to them that I would be repeating myself far more than I already have if I did. For those who might be interested in listening to Field Day, possibly driven by the weird amount of praise it gets online, then I'd recommend you just stick to some of the highlights I mentioned here because I definitely don't think a full listen is worth it. And that's coming from a guy who's done that several times. I think I just found my new favorite bodily sound. So, have you ever wondered what having tinnitus with a sigh of seizures would sound like? I have no idea why you would ask that, but if you did, then do I have the album for you? Well, technically this album is actually two EPs, Ventolin and Ventolin Remixes, 
However, I'm combining them for this video since they came out the same day, have a very similar sound, and a lot of other people combine them. And while technically every song on this album is the title track, the main attraction here, the one that got a music video, is Ventolin Salbutamol Mix. It starts with this loud, high-pitched ringing sound, which is apparently used because a common side effect of the asthma medicine the track was named after is tinnitus. Soon, that ringing is joined by even louder screeching and industrial percussion, and mysterious and escalating synth patterns which play throughout its almost 6 minute runtime. <laughs> This is probably Aphex Twin's most infamous song ever, especially since it also came out in I Care Because You Do. You either love it or you hate it, and I'll just let the position of this album on the list let you know my opinions on it. Ventolin isn't all that bad though. Honestly, the beat alone would be pretty sick if it wasn't for everything else. Other lowlights for me are the similarly sounding Wheeze mix, the unsettling Karharic mix, and the Praise and Beeble mix, which I could almost forgive for being nothing special if it wasn't for that annoying ending. <laughs> but this album isn't all that bad. My favorite track is the Crows Mangigas mix, which spans three sections. The first two are very fun and joyful. But then the third section, titled Respect List, has a creepy robotic voice reading out a list of people who Richard is giving respect to. Weird. Respect going out to Shami, Mafu, Gentle John, Psylop Industries. Another highlight for me is the Probus Mix, which has a certain section that is uncharacteristically beautiful and even touching for this album. The remixes by Psylob and Luke Viber also have some interesting things going on in them. And then the bonus tracks from the 2017 digital re-release are split for me between the Ventolin E Ventolin 1 Un and the Cutesy Hilo. And then all of the other songs are nothing special quality wise in my opinion. So overall, Ventolin is a very, very spotty album, but also really interesting. I could talk a lot more about this, but to keep things short, Ventolin is a very weird album that could have been okay, but suffers from being way too aggressive and in your face to be enjoyable in any way outside of a few tracks. The creatively titled Orphan DJ Selic 2006-08 came out in 2015, but it's just composed of tracks from... Actually, I'll let you figure out when. This period was significant as it saw Richard starting to experiment with an early version of his modern sound. This EP is more similar to Field Day rather than the stuff Richard released in the late 2000s though. I mean, it has an underdeveloped version of a sound Richard would perfect later. Almost all of its tracks are instantly forgettable. Really, what Orphan DJ Selleck does differently is that it doesn't have any lowlights, but it doesn't have any highlights either. These tracks are just very... God, I hate to say this... Mid. However, that doesn't mean there's nothing interesting to talk about. The first track, Surge Phoenix Rendered 2, starts out promising with its unique percussion, retro sounding synths, and arpeggiated acid. To be honest, I was almost about to like this track until I saw a YouTube comment saying it was just a techno version of Temporary Secretary by Paul McCartney and now I can only hear that. <laughs> Another track I almost liked is Simple Slamming B2, which has one of the best beats on the EP, but those ugly out of tune synths ruin it for me. If I had to pick a track I liked the least, it would be Bonus EMT Beats, which is almost 5 minutes of nothing but... beats. I mean they're good, but I'd like a little bit more than that and a creepy drone at the end. All the other tracks aren't special, except for one. Midi Pipe 1C SDS3 Time Cube Slash Clone Drum is easily the most interesting track here. 
why? Well, I mean, just listen to it. It's very unique to say the least. I actually really like its first half for its weird ass groove, but it has a sour ending I'm not a fan of. So yeah, all these tracks are middle of the road. By itself, I would have definitely put this EP lower on the list, but what saves it from going into the depths are its 2017 bonus tracks, which are honestly better than anything on the EP proper. However, the thing is, I can't talk about them yet, as they will reappear later on the list. Far later. Confederation Trough is one of two releases Richard put out in the late 2000s under the name of The Tuss. One interesting thing about this alias is the fact that people didn't even know it was Richard when it was first being released, as these releases were credited to two people who do not exist. It was only a rumor that he was behind it all. Another interesting thing is that Aphex Twin fans fucking love The Tuss. I have never heard anything short of praise for this alias, and to be honest, I get some of the hype, but not when it comes to this EP. The first track, Fredjugalon 6, starts out promising, but then what I think is an acid pattern that is comparable in sound to loud sharding comes in. Eventually it goes away, but the rest of the track isn't all that interesting except for one very small section. At least after that, we have my favorite track, El Spaca. This one combines bouncy synths, fun beats, and rhythmic breathing, which sounds weird at first, but it actually gives the song a lot of charm. And the third and final track on this EP depends on what release you got. Thanks for making things simple, Richard. If you got the CD version of this EP, then you would get a decent track in GX1 Solo with its grumbling bass line and fragile notes, although I like it more for its occasional freakouts. However, if you got the vinyl version, you would get a kunk, which is easily the weirdest track here with its creepy atmosphere, weird beat, and retro synth stabs that feel like they are randomly placed. So Richard would go on to do some really crazy stuff with the Tuss, and we'd get a slight glimpse at that with Confederation Trough. However, this EP is meh at best. So you can all hear the terrible sound you never want to hear when working on turbine engines. Now here's what I think is the second worst Analord EP, Analord 3. Now despite how low it is, it actually starts with a favorite of mine in Boxing Day. I just love its minimalistic acid, popping synths, laid back beat, and atmosphere that is just absolutely fantastic. It's been one of my favorite Analord tracks for the longest time. Clop Job has a brighter but similarly moody atmosphere that I like. But then it gets really ugly in the second half, ruining the track for me. And then there is Medieval Rave 1 and 2, which are both incredibly disjointed. If anything, you should skip these tracks and just listen to Medieval Rave off the SoundCloud dump, which is far better. However, Stabbage, which is the only bonus track, is an improvement. Despite having some awkward moments, this is a decent song with its memorably moody melody. And that's Analord 3. While nothing on it comes close to being as good as Boxing Day, there are some good moments like the first half of Clop Job, which is what elevates it over Analord 9.
Right after that is another Annalord EP, the first numerical one in fact. I'm probably not going to get any nice comments for this placement though, as Annalord 1 has a few fan favorites from the series like Stepping Filter 101, Where's Your Girlfriend, and Grumpy Acid. I can definitely see why these tracks are loved so much, especially my favorite of the bunch in Where's Your Girlfriend. These tracks are unforgettably catchy and angsty. But outside of that and Annalord's usually great beats, these tracks don't leave a big impression on me, mostly because of their acid, which I think is pretty weak. And this issue also shows up in other tracks like MC4 Acid and Annalord 158B, which have very little for me to actually find interest in. <laughs> Bubble and Squeak 2 is the only other song that stands out despite this due to its cool background synths, but even then it's really short. While those tracks generally don't impress though, Canticle Draw is straight up awful with this annoying progression. The bonus tracks, however, are probably the part of this EP I dislike the most, as they are just worse versions of Canticle Drawl and Where's Your Girlfriend. So while Annalord 1 may have the most tracks of any Annalord EP, some of which are highly respected by fans, I find most of them to not strike any major chord with me. Of course there are a few moments that do in a bad way, but there are also a few moments that do in a good way, allowing this EP to just barely edge out Annalord 3. The Caustic Window LP is a lot, and to understand it's lotness, you have to learn about its complicated history first. This 15 track album was originally going to be released in 1994, but only 5 vinyls were ever made. Skip 20 years later, and one of these copies is listed on Discogs for $13,500. Seeing this, Aphex Twin fans created a Kickstarter that raised $67,424 to buy the Caustic Window LP and distribute it digitally. After that, the copy was sold on eBay and bought by motherfucking Notch of all people for $46,300, and that money would go to Richard, the Kickstarter backers, and charity. Eventually, the album would become widespread enough for everyone to listen to it, making this possible. There isn't much of a cohesive musical identity to the Caustic Window LP though, outside of the fact that it's very emblematic of Richard's early 90s and even late 80s sound. The tracks vary a lot in quality though. Several of them are pretty middle of the road, but there are some good ones. Flutie and Jazz Fades, for example, are similarly low-key and simple songs that are just a joy to chill out to. Meanwhile, Mumbly is probably one of the most unique tracks, combining samples from Wacky Races, a messed up version of the beat to Shocky 7th Path, and very bright synths into a very interesting package. Squidge in the Fridge though has always been a track I've been embarrassed to admit is a favorite of mine, because just listen to it. But fuck it, I have to realize that I have no shame and that this track is a banger. 101 Rainbow's Ambient Mix is the longest track here and also another one of my favorites, although I think the alternate version of it, 5 Score Year from the SoundCloud Dump, is better. While these tracks are highlights on the album, I think that for the most part they are just good and nothing crazy. However, there are some really bad songs at the end of this album. Flaps and Cunt are so distorted that you can't even hear the songs under all of it. And then the last track on the album sees Richard play phone pranks. Did you? Did I win? 
No, but somebody rang me just now. I'll admit the trick is pretty clever, but what am I supposed to get out of it except for the fact that Richard is a chaotic nuisance? I already knew that, I'm well acquainted with it. So that's pretty much it for the Caustic Window LP, but I know what everyone is dying to know. Is it really worth $46,300? No, like, not at all. Like, even if it was Richard's best release ever, 46 k is a little bit too much. Honestly though, I don't even know how much I'd pay for it. While it does have several tracks with that early Aphex Twin Sheen that I'll occasionally come back to, most of it is just... Eh. This makes the Caustic Window LP more interesting for its story rather than its music. Huh, this is interesting. Barcelona 160623 is one of two brand new EPs Richard added to his collection this year. This one specifically coming out during a show he played in Barcelona. And on the surface, this is really cool. Getting two new releases after four years of inactivity is a phenomenal thing to see, right when I was starting to think that Richard might be hanging up his cleats. However, there are a few things hindering my enjoyment. First of all, of course this had to be announced and come out while I was already really deep into work on this project. Second of all, I mean just look, this is in 51st place. Barcelona has a whopping two tracks coming in at a marathon seven minutes. So it's easily the shortest release on this list, but come on, it's a single. And anyways, its first track, RFC Part 8, is a good song that sees Richard show off some warm and chill acid alongside some other laid-back textures. It's not blowing my socks off or anything, and it's definitely not what I expect from Richard's comeback from a break, but it's an enjoyable listen. <music> AFX FME, though, is not. It starts and ends in an interesting way with this weird loop. But its middle section is really boring. All of this makes Barcelona 1606-23 one of the releases of all time. Jokes aside though, while I do like RFC Part 8, this was disappointing to see after waiting for a new official release for 4 years. This is just a small single that happened to come out first though. The real hype is for the second release this year that came out over a month later. We'll get to it when we get to it though. Next we have another interesting release in the simply titled Computer Controlled Acoustic Instruments Part 2 from 2015. What makes it so special can be seen in what is apparently Part 1, Drux. Yeah, this EP is a continuation of a few ideas originally explored on Drux, mainly electroacoustic instrumentation. Although unlike Drux's fragile and moody electroacoustic pieces, this EP focuses more on combining awkward melodies with groovy percussion to create a very unique sound. It has 13 tracks, which sounds like a lot for an EP, but most of them are just little funky loops or experimental interludes. And that's actually what I feel is the biggest problem with this EP, is only around half of it feels like complete songs, and as for those complete songs, they're pretty varied. Discat All Prepared 1 Mix 13 makes for an excellent opener, and easily the best track here, doing a great job at setting our foreboding tone, and showing off all the sounds Richard has in store for us. Another highlight is Discat 1, which is most noble for its use in Better Call Saul of all things in the episode Namaste. I don't know anything about the show, but even I have to admit it's used brilliantly in this scene, which also explains why I always feel the need to commit vandalism whenever I hear this song. Soon after is Disc Prep 4, which I've always weirdly liked because it has this otherworldly rhythm that is repetitive to an almost hypnotic extent. <music> hey! 
Hat 5C0001 Rec 4, the closer, is similarly repetitive, but in a way that's kind of grating, even with the creepy twist it gradually takes. Piano Untenant Happen is a beautiful piano piece that calls back to similar songs on drugs, but I feel like it lacks the same emotional punch as some of those tracks. And then I haven't talked about Disc Prep Calyrec 2 Barn Dance Slow and Disc Prepped 1 yet, but that's because they're both really boring. So computer controlled acoustic instruments is honestly a bit of a disappointment, especially when it's a pseudo sequel to a widely loved album like Drugs. Some of these tracks are completely forgettable and even more are way too short to comment on. However, it does have some great songs that really explore this new sound to its fullest extent. So while this EP isn't all it's cracked up to be, I still think it's a decent excursion from Richard's typical sound. It hasn't been long since we looked at the first Numerical Annalord EP, so now it's time to look at the last, and honestly most forgettable, Annalord 11. I call it forgettable because while the other EPs had different and unique things going on in them, Annalord 11 feels like a collection of leftovers. However, that's not to say they're all bad. The first track, which happens to be my favorite, is w32.mydoom.au at mm, which is an almost nine minute song centered around three edgy notes with an ever shifting and brooding composition that sounds like it came right off of Annalord 10. VBS.redloft.b is a track most often touted as a highlight though, and I can only guess it's a remnant from Annalord 5 as it sounds very similar to Silenin in the best possible way. It's a great song! Until 2 minutes and 45 seconds in. Yeah, this part has always left a sour taste in my mouth and really hinders my enjoyment of the track. Finishing off the EP proper are two tracks called Backdoor.Rinky.S5 and 4, and they're... they're... Bad. They're bad. And then this EP has the most bonus tracks out of any Anlord release at 5 and they continue this EP's theme of feeling like leftovers. Both Not Disturbing Mammoth tracks are just a cool baseline and nothing else. And in the title for an alternate version of vbs.redloft.b, they spell worse wrong. However, I do have to give credit to Love7 and 3 Notes Con for being pretty good. So this just leaves Annalord 11 as a whole to feel mixed and incoherent. Even then, I still think there's more good than bad on this release. <laughs> now we're at the first proper entry in the Analog Bubble Bath series in the list. If you remember what I said about Analog Bubble Bath 3.1, then you already know the background of this release, but for clarification, I'll be talking about the CD version. I already talked about Cat 00897A1, AA1, and A2, and as a refresher, I really like the first two, but not so much the third. There's more good tracks like the first two though. For example, if you're a fan of Polynomial C, which everyone should be, then .215061 and .00089569 are the tracks for you as they have similarly spacey synths combined with epic beats, the latter of which being especially ready for the dance floor. <music> On 
On the original release, there was a track labeled .018871 that was actually two different tracks panned to opposite channels, meaning that the only way to listen to either track would be to manually isolate one of the channels. These tracks are separated on the CD release and THANK GOD for that because one is really good and the other is really bad. The good one, and the track that has always been a favorite of mine ever since I first listened to this album, is the one on the right channel. It combines delayed vocal samples, industrial beat, and strings to create an atmosphere perfect for a movie scene where someone's sneaking into some sort of bass. The one on the left channel though is nowhere near as appealing, sounding like what those people sneaking to the bass are forced to listen to after being caught. Two other lowlights are .1993841 and .552780373, which have some good ideas but suffer from being way too repetitive and annoying. And then there's just a few tracks I'm more mixed on, one of them being .942937. It combines a soft and beautiful atmosphere with a very hard and abrasive beat. This is a formula Richard has done very well in other releases, but this one gets hard to listen to sometimes. There's also two tracks labeled CD only, but the only one worth anything is the first, which is, surprisingly enough, a dark ambient piece. As you can see, Analog Bubble Bath 3 has a bit of everything. You could even call it a mess. But what is consistent among all the tracks here is that they have that early 90s Apex Twin charm, which makes it really hard to hate this album even at the worst of times. There's also a bunch of classic tracks here, but even then I still have to recognize this album's flaws, which is why it's this low on the list. <laughs> Donkey Rhubarb is an EP that has several obvious connections to I Care Because You Do. This can be seen in the songs, the cover, and even the fact that this EP came out a few months after that album. So Donkey Rhubarb kinda screams I Care Because You Do leftovers. Some people might say that this means that this EP is inessential and easy to overlook. And they're not wrong, but I still think it has some merit. The title track and only single is the most well-known song on this EP and I can see why. Not only does it have an iconic video with these bear things that became mascots for Aphex Twin, but the song itself also has a lovely amount of silliness and unforgettable melodies, although I've always been back and forth on how much I could tolerate those high-pitched bleeping noises. Pancake Lizard, though, is my favorite off of the EP as it makes for a very sunny and laid-back closer. While these two songs are very upbeat, the two tracks in the middle of this EP take a far more dark turn. Fast Deference is easily the track I dislike the most, being pretty annoying and having even more bleeps than Donkey Rhubarb. And then there is probably the biggest standout on this EP, a cover of Ictedral from I Care Because You Do done by none other than Philip Glass. This orchestral recreation is lengthy but gives the original synthetic strings a well needed upgrade. However, I still like the original more as this version is missing the extremely distorted kicks. So Donkey Rhubarb as an EP doesn't have much of a musical identity outside of being related to I Care Because You Do. However, there are some hints of sounds that would later show up on Richard's next album, and some of these tracks are good. Really, what I said earlier perfectly describes this EP. Inessential, but it still has a little merit. Would you look at that? 
It's been a while since I talked about the Joyrex EPs. Last time I basically shat all over the last two, but now I'm here to give a small amount of admiration to the first one from 1992. This EP starts off very meh with the title track. It's not anything special, having some okay and not okay moments. The next track, however, is very promising as it's a cover of Popcorn by Gershon Kingsley, a very famous and influential song in the history of electronic music. And here, we see Richard combine its familiar melodies with breakbeats. This, on paper, should sound amazing. So why does it sound so bad? The main issue of Popcorn is that it has some of the worst production I've ever heard from Richard. It is like a precursor to Ventolin it hurts that much to listen to. That one left a bad taste in my mouth, so thank god we have the best caustic window song in Cordialitron next. It is a surprisingly lush and fun song that would fit a lot better on something like Selected Ambient Works 85-92. Italic Eyeball, which comes right after, isn't that bad either, being more of a nice and laid-back piece with a mysterious atmosphere. And then finally there are two short intermission tracks on this EP. AFX114 has the same ear rapey problems as Popcorn. and Pigeon Street is a weirdly cute closer. So in the end, Joyrex J4 is far better than the previous two. However, its first half is yikes, and I only ever come back to it mainly for Cordialitron. So congrats Joyrex J4, you get by just because you have one great song and some other stuff. Good job. If Donkey Rhubarb is connected to I Care Because You Do, then Peel Session is connected to both, as it's basically the embodiment of Richard's music in 1995. This EP was released in 2019 as a part of Warp Records' 30th anniversary, but these tracks actually originate from a Peel session held in 1995. Now for those who don't know what a Peel session is, there are sessions held by John Peel on BBC Radio 1 in which a few tracks provided from a certain artist would be played. Literally thousands of these sessions have been held with thousands of bands and artists, and Richard has done two of them. What was the first one? Well, it was held in 1992, this was the track list, and it's honestly better than the second one, but was never officially released. Peel Session 2 was instead. Its first track is Slow Bird Whistle, which is a simple song that has a very warm and feel-good sound to it. But it also feels a bit unpolished like a Melodies from Mars track at times. The second track is the original mix of Radiator from Selected Amy Works Volume 2, and it's the one track on this EP I dislike the most, as I think it ruins the eerie mood of the Selected Amy Works version by trying to make it danceable. Things get better with P-String, which sounds like a lost I Care Because You Do track with its epic orchestration and distorted kicks. And the closer is just Pancake Lizard, a track I've already given my praises to. And just like that, that's Peel Session 2. Yeah, it's basically just four random tracks from around 1995, some of which would never be seen again for decades, shoved on to a release. But that's Peel Sessions for ya. And anyways, besides the Radiator mix, these tracks are solid, which is enough to get this far on the list.
In here we find Joyrex J5, the second of the four Joyrex EPs and, in my opinion, the best release Richard ever put out under Caustic Window. Which isn't saying much. It starts off with Astro Blaster, which is very bouncy and abrasive. It's fun at first, but slowly gets irritating over its 5.5 minute runtime. However, after that is the best song on the EP, On the Romance Tip. What I like about it the most is its grand and airy synths which are absolutely lovely and combine very well with its beat. If I have to give the Joyrex EPs as a whole something, it's the fact that their chill out material, while scarce, is pretty damn good. And after that is the tail track, which is centered around these very harsh synth stabs. It may seem like a bit of a rehash of Astro Blaster at first, but what elevates it over that song is a switch up near the end. So, three tracks in, and this EP has actually been pretty solid so far. Let's see what the last track has in store for us. Huh. Yeah, so the last track is called R2D2, and it sounds... like that. I guess it's nice to hear something that's truly unique when compared to Richard's other stuff, and it isn't exactly unlistenable or anything but it just sounds like a mess of random stuff that was thrown haphazardly into a track. It's easily the worst one here. So Joyrex J5 has a crappy ending, but for the most part, it's able to overcome all of the other Caustic Window releases by being okay and somewhat consistent quality-wise. Now, some of you may be saying, hey, that sounds like an insult. This EP is an oddity in Aphex Twin's early catalog, essentially being a compilation of four demos Richard sent Warp Records in 1990 before he had even released anything. All the tracks are named Gak and have a similar techno sound, but they are different, trust me. Not much happens in the first two minutes of Gak 1, but then these lovely pianos come in and they lighten up the song for me. I'm not sure whether it's the reverb or the color they add to the song, but I just love their inclusion. The closer, Gak 4, is another favorite of mine, even though it sounds so goddamn cheesy. Like this sounds more at home on the first level of some DS game, not an Aphex Win EP, but I still love it. You know that meme with Marge Simpson and the potato? That's me with this song. Sadly, the two tracks in between are nothing special. While they're both decently moody, they have sections that are more annoying than anything, especially with Gak 3 and its aggravating beat. This EP would later get 5 bonus tracks in 2017, almost doubling its runtime, but they aren't special either. Overall, they are middle of the road, with the only parts standing out being the zero emotion I feel while listening to Gak Bass. And Gak 7's big horns which come out of nowhere. So that's Gak. Well, it has some great songs and decent sections, as a whole, it's not much. Although Gak 1 and 4 have enough charm to get to this spot, so if you listen to anything off this EP, listen to those.
And the Lord 5 is a very simple EP. There's only two tracks and I have good and bad news about them. Starting with the bad news, I do not like Reunion 2. At first it doesn't seem like that bad of a track as it has some interesting melodies and a lot of energy, but it just does not sound good. The production is all over the place, the acid doesn't even fit the song, and it just sounds like a mess, which is a shame since I can actually see a pretty good song underneath all of this bad execution. <laughs> Now with the bad news out of the way, the good news is that I love the next track, Silent In. It is what Reunion 2 should have been. It never fails to get me amped up and it sounds so much better. <music> to put simply, Silent In is awesome and I love it a lot more than I dislike Reunion 2. Then there are two bonus tracks that almost double this EP's runtime, but they aren't that special. Gong Acid is a minimalistic and awkward piece that doesn't leave an impression on me. And then there's an alternate but not much better version of Reunion 2. So as I said, Analord 5 is very simple. We have one bad track and one far better track that just goes to show how much of a difference one great song can make on something so short. And the Lord 6 is a release I wanted to put a lot higher because it has some of the best tracks from the And the Lord series, but it also has some of the worst. First of all, the Teen Acid does a good job at establishing the sound of this EP with its warm atmosphere and catchy grooves. But things really get good with Snivel Chew. This frantic track has a great combination of punchy percussion, awesome melodies, and an acid pattern that sounds more like bubblegum than acid. However, I'm Self Employed is my favorite track here, and also the first Analord song I had ever heard. It is similarly catchy and melodic, but also has a very down to earth feel that gives it a lot of charm. Even the bonus tracks run characteristically solid. There's three tracks all named Bodmin. The first two are good, but the third one is amazing. It's baffling how a track that sounds this good and fits this well with the other songs isn't on the proper EP. I've given this EP a lot of praise, so why could it possibly be this low on the list? Well, after I'm self-employed are two tracks under a minute long, collectively referred to as Analog Talks. The first, Clacknib, is completely unlistenable. And the second, Chorus 3, is listenable but does not fit here. But the real problem is the 7 minute mess of sounds that is analog ins. This track, which is apparently a collaboration with experimental artist Voophos, is just a mix of directionless ideas that are only occasionally coherent. <laughs> Analogins is not offensively bad, but Analord 6 had a lot of potential with its first half, and I feel like this track ruins it, which is why this EP is so far down on the list. However, if its second half had been replaced by some of those bonus tracks, then this EP would be a lot higher, possibly even the best of the series. Honestly, if I saw that damn thing in my living room, I'd stomp on it until it was a small brown stain. Melodies from Mars is an incredibly weird album. In fact, it's one of the weirdest inclusions I could have made onto the list, and that's not just because of the music. 
While all the songs on it are from 1995, it was never officially released, but rather leaked. In fact, as far as I know, the cover and album title are fan-made. Also looking at the track list, what sticks out immediately are the demos of Fingerbib and Logan Rockwitch, two of the best songs off the Richard D. James album. They definitely boost this album a bit, which is neat because the other songs aren't nearly as solid. One problem I have with a lot of these tracks is that they're very simple in structure. Like most of Richard's early work was simple, but a lot of these tracks start with section 1, then go into section 2, then later go back to section 1, but holy shit fucking watch out because here we go with section 2 again! Rinse and repeat. While this isn't a big issue on individual tracks, it eventually becomes tedious when listening to the full album. A lot of these original tracks also sound very amateurish, like this wasn't made by a guy with 10 years of experience at this point, but someone who was just learning their equipment for the first time. And yeah, that's actually pretty much the case. It's said that these tracks were some of the first Richard ever made when he was switching to making music on his computer around 1995. A particularly bad example of this amateurish sound, and the worst song on the album, is track 1. It sounds very sloppily put together and is just a confusing listen overall. On the other hand, my favorite song is track 10, which is probably the closest Richard has ever gotten to straight up chip tune. It's so happy and playful, it would fit right into a retro video game. There's also songs like Track 3 and Track 11 that I enjoy, but that's about it. While Melodies for Mars is good overall, especially for an unreleased album, I can't lie that's definitely being carried by those Richard D. James album demos. The quality of the other material also isn't the best in more ways than one, and there's nothing necessarily groundbreaking on this album, but still, it's an enjoyable listen.